we'll get going, I'm on, right? The thing's blipping back and forth, cool. So when it, when it comes to transformation, when we're, anytime we're talking about the Word of God, we want to understand it's to be implemented in our life, you know? It's not just to be heard, it's to be done. But not done in a legalistic fashion, <clears throat> like I used to do years ago, expecting some kind of result. Because what I've learned about this year, especially this year, the craziness of this year has bubbled up stuff in people's lives that we probably thought we had a handle on. You know, all of a sudden, stuff just keeps hitting us and hitting us, and all of a sudden, either frustration or anger or worry or doubt or whatever, these things start bubbling up, and it's like, man, I thought I was free from that. I thought I had a handle on that thing, you know? And what it's done to me is remind me that I'm not quite to that place that I thought I was. You know, sometimes we think we're doing pretty good, and that's okay. There's nothing, you don't want to be negative and critical about yourself, but you still, the scripture says, hey, let's honestly evaluate ourselves, you know. Let's take an honest evaluation where we're at. So every now and then I like to do that, especially this time of year, I'll get reflective and stuff. But what we want to do is just honestly evaluate but not be comfortable in that evaluation. We want to go better. We want to move forward. We want to continue to, in that sanctification process, transformation process, or whatever we want to call it. And um, so what I've noticed in my life and, and even other people's lives and listening to conversations, it's like, wow, stuff's been bubbling up. You know? And what I believe God wants to do in this transformation series now, because I said, God, you, you set up a series to do a kingdom reset. You know, we're, we got to go back and reset some things, return to factory settings. He says, oh, I am. You got to go back to those places where you thought you were all set. <laughs> you weren't really all set. Because guess what? Through all the turmoil and pressure and, and the pressing, stuff is bubbled up. You know, when the heat gets turned on, the impurities rise to the top. So he says, there's still some transformation that needs to go on. So I said, okay, God, that's, that's cool. So let's work on that, that process. And, and the reason why I told you that story earlier is because it can be so simple as that and so subtle as that. I don't pay enough, no attention to nothing. In fact, I wasn't walking, watching those spiritual video when I was walking on the treadmill. I was totally physically engaged and involved, both mentally and physically. Watching a show and walking. And it was only because that show was over and I'm scrolling through and I see this thing and I go, okay, what the heck? That's an hour something and I can just keep walking if I want. And I just put it on, no thought, nothing. But of course, God was directing me there. I didn't know. That's how subtle it gets. You know what I mean? The further you walk in your walk with God, the more subtle he gets and the more in tune with him we need to get that way. So then as I started watching it, um, you know, and, and that story came up. I'm like, it hit me in the face. I'm like, man. But then I didn't go and chew on it. Oh, let me go pray for it. Oh, just forget it and continue listening. No, you deal with it right then and there. And that's the place we got to get to things in our lives. When all of a sudden, you know, Robin and I were talking about this the other day. Why are we always getting so... All right, how can I... Let me back that up a little bit. Boop. When we hear something... Okay, something gets said, we see something on TV, whatever. However, we get the information. We get so bombarded with information, it's nuts. When the information comes in and hits you and it evokes an emotional response, negative, positive, it don't matter. One thing we need to do is go to God and say, God, is that true? Why don't we go to him and ask him? You know, because the Bible says he's going to guide us in all truth. So usually what we do is we take that, especially if it's negative, we let it get us all worked up. Now we get in an emotional fervor without even knowing if that's true in the first place. So again, we've got to get back to the place where God is going to guide and direct every single aspect of our life and understand there's a devil out there who's a liar, who wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And I think we tend to forget that because we, uh, we get too good at compartmentalizing. What's that word? <coughs> compartmentalizing. Thank you, dear. Putting out a little life in a box. Like I said, I'm on the treadmill and now I'm in my physical box. I'm just down there exercising, working out, not understanding I am still a spirit being living out a temporary human existence. 
And God reminded me of that from what I saw. And I said, great. And I even went and bought the woman's book. And it's been really good because it's been on, it's on discerning of spirits. And there ain't a lot of literature out there about that. You know what? I found out I'm not as weird as I thought I was sometimes. So, but I said all that to say this, that the Holy Spirit wants to work in our lives. He wants to work to the place where he wants to bring us deeper, rooting and grounding us deeper in Christ so that he can begin to transform us into the image of God. And what we need to do is begin to cooperate with that. So I want, I want us to think about this because this, this will probably help you. Remember when you were in school, and let's just say math is the subject. So you're in school, and even in kindergarten or before you get to school, your parents start teaching you what? How to recognize numbers, right? This is one, and then you start learning how to write the numbers. Then you start learning how to count. And then you go into school and you start learning how to group those numbers together. You know, you start learning basic math, add, subtract, whatever. But notice it's a progression. And you get into high school and you start learning trigonometry and geometry and calculus. Now that's a good response because see what happens? That, that's a sanctification thing. That's how God brings us through the process. And when we hit that place we don't like, we go, eh. I ain't going no further. See? Because what happens is we go so far. Okay, writing the numbers wasn't so bad. You know, adding one and one and two wasn't so bad. But now when you get into trigonometry, sine, cosine, and tangent, and you're like, what is that? Uh, algebra, uh, not algebra. I love trigonometry and I loved algebra. Geometry was a little funky. But I love those things. Because for a logical mind that, that goes step after step, it was perfect. Teach me how to do that. And it, it was great. And someone like that, or some of you all, probably aren't wired the same way I was. So it was harder. So we struggled with it. But see, the Holy Spirit works the same way in our life. He takes us to a place and we go, oh, that wasn't so bad. I learned to write. Number one, two, three. And then he moves us to another place. Oh, now I can count up to 100. And now he moves us to another place. Oh, I can add. One and one is two. He wants to bring us into the calculus place. Not just calculus. He wants us to go into Einstein's quantum physics stuff. You know, when you saw the whole board, just like, and you looked at it like, what is that? The Holy Spirit, he wants to take us past that. Because he wants to show us things that we can't even imagine or grasp or get our head around. Because it's not about getting our head around it. It's about him taking us to a place and a going through a process where he wants to bring us from one stage of glory to another. And again, to remind you of 2 Corinthians 3, 18 in the Amplified, it says we um, are progressively being transformed into the image, one degree of glory to another. So again, we learn to write the numbers. We learn to put them together. We learn to count. We learn to do basic math. And what we got to do now is get to that place when we get to that, eh, push through. And say, no, it's only eh because I'm fighting with it. It's not bad for me. He wants to bring me there, and that's where the conflict is, and we need to push through that thing, because we've got to understand the more active we are in this transformation process, the quicker it's going to happen. You're going to keep getting changed and, and from glory to glory, because we need to participate in the behavior. Because we were good with the one and one is two and all that stuff, and maybe even algebra, but then we get into trigonometry, and it's like, ah, eh, no, not going that far. And we certainly balk at quantum physics. See, what's, what's happening in general, just to continue on that vein, is the more dumbed down we become, either as a human being or a spirit being, the more easily we're deceived. And that's what's scary. Because then the lie can go out there and we don't even know that it is a lie. 
because we've never gotten past the one and one is two stage. Now they're throwing an Albraic equation at us, telling us what it means and we just buy it because we've not allowed God to bring us to that place of transformation that we can see it for what it is. Because you want to understand the devil still is out to steal, kill, and destroy. Case closed. That's never going to change. So again, you still need to be suspect of that. You still need to be discerning. You still need to be, have your eyes opened. As we sang earlier, you know, awaken your people. Church is sleeping. Sleeping bad. You know, I, I, I expect folk that don't know Christ as their Lord to maybe be in slumber. But the Church of Jesus Christ ought not to be in slumber. But I think because of what we're talking about there in the, these different places, you know, you're trying to share physics with somebody that just barely knows how to add one and one is two. And they don't think that they're the problem because they think, okay, I'm comfortable here. And they've stopped their transformation process there. And again, that's okay. That may be as far as they're going to go or want to go. I'm not saying this in a negative way. But that person is more open to deception, being lied to and destroyed, than the person further down the road, only because now they're more awakened to more things. Does that make sense? So that's where this transformation process, I believe, needs to bring us. We need to cooperate with it. That's, that's an important aspect. But not only that, the more revelation you gain during the process, your level of responsibility increases in working it out in your life. See, for some reason, we bought this lie, knowledge is power. Knowledge ain't no power. There's a lot of smart people sitting around doing nothing. We have to work the work, we have to work out the Word of God in our life. You know, I remember Bishop Bryant saying a couple years back now, do the book. You know, just a simple little phrase stuck with me. Do the book. You know, we always want to know the book so we can fight doctrinally with somebody else and prove our point, and neither one of the two people are doing the book. Do the book. Because transformation is about doing, being changed, not so you can win in Bible trivia, but about seeing the manifestation of the Word of God come to pass, not only in your life, but in someone else's life. See, that's the vision we have for this place, to declare the kingdom of God and demonstrate its realities. That's our vision. We ain't just going to talk about it. We're going to do it. You guys believe in healing? Yes. Well, let's see. Okay, come on down. We'll lay hands on you. We'll slather you in oil. I don't care what we do. No praying tongues over you, whatever. Yeah, we believe in healing. We're not just going to talk it. We're going to do it or whatever. So we got to get to that place and understand this is what it's about. So again, Romans 12, um, I'll probably go in, in verse 1 also, um, but we're not quite there yet. Because there is one part in, in verse 1 that is important. It's brethren, by the mercies of God. Do you understand everything is done by the mercy of God? His mercies is the power. Because he's merciful to us. But let me just read this quick. we have already commented on this a lot. Verse 2 says this. Stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you. Do not allow the world to mold you into its own image. Don't allow this world to mold you and conform you into what it thinks you ought to be, what you think, what it thinks you ought to do, what it thinks you ought to believe. That's probably the one most frustration I have now is the information, disinformation war that goes on. I mean, we literally have people telling you that they are the only ones that can tell you what you ought to think and trying to shut down free thinking. If you get an adverse opinion on anyone else, we're going to shut you down. That's just insane. This is America still. So again, stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you. It's okay to be different. And if you ain't different and you ain't looking weird, you ain't functioning as a spirit being in a natural realm. We're supposed to look different, act different, sound different. But see, what we've allowed is the negativity we receive to help conform us and tone us down. We see that in the church all the time. 
Church is toned down. There's no more holiness, sanctification being talked about in the church. Except here, because I'm weird. I know it. It says, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit. But let God transform you into a new person through a total reformation of how you think. First of all, let him give you a new mind. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life satisfying and perfect in his eyes, then you will know what God wants you to do. The thing that you'll do will be perfect, pleasing, and uh, good, perfect, and pleasing. Well, you know. You know the thing. It's written there. <laughs> <laughs> so the first truth we learn, we, we got to really get this piece. The Holy Spirit is the foundation of all transformation. You cannot, cannot, cannot be fully transformed into the image of God without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Okay? You can learn biblical truth. You can function in biblical truth. But to truly be transformed from the inside out only comes by the power of the Spirit. So again, I don't want anyone to misinterpret anything I'm saying. You know, some people are going to go to one and one is two, and that's it. Some people are going to go to algebra, and that's it. So again, that's your business. I'm just a seed sower. I'm just throwing out the word of God. And however it falls and where I, whatever it falls on, that's not my responsibility. I'm the sower. So again, as the word goes forth and, and you, as you get involved in this transformation process, it's your responsibility to walk it out. So you've got to understand that. And the more resident, the more... Um, engaged you are with that, the quicker and faster it's going to happen. Again, just like my story. I'm on the treadmill. The Spirit of God spoke to me about something. I immediately dealt with it, and it was gone. And I'll be honest, I was a little surprised that it went that quick. I mean, like instantly. I mean, instantly I felt different because it was an emotional thing. Instantly. I was like, wow. Because again, I cooperated with the Spirit. I'm trying to do the book. So when God speaks to me about something, I'm going to deal with it right then and there, no matter what's going on. So again, without the power source, I get concerned that, that you're only going to get so far, and if that's what you want to do, that's okay. It's all cool. But again, remember, it is the key, foundational truth that we can't just gloss over because without it, we don't change. We can change by those self-help coping mechanisms like I said people do. I don't want a self-help book. I want the Word of God to transform me from glory to glory. So here's a few questions that we're going to kind of deal with as we continue. And, and this you know, sometimes it sounds like I'm going back or whatever. This is all fresh and new. I'm only getting what I'm getting and giving you what I'm getting. So if it sounds like, oh, you should have probably done that a couple weeks ago, that's what it is. But the questions are going to be, what does it actually mean to be transformed? Do we even know what it means to be transformed? Like I said, it's not to make a better you. What does God's transform, what's the goal of transformation actually look like? Because a lot of people keep saying, you know, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? Do you understand Jesus was in a different time, different culture, different everything else? So it's not that you do what he did. You take the principles of what he did and you adapt them to the present day life that we're in. They're principles. Yes, they're truth. Jesus said, I can do the same things he did and even greater. Right? What's that look like, though? I'm not quite sure, but that's okay. Because you can still do what he did, so I can still desire to do what he did. Does that make sense? And we're going to share something here in a minute of what he actually did. So when he laid hands, people were healed. He raised the dead. He walked through people. That already tweaked you. You're like, how am I going to walk through somebody? He walked through a wall. Can you walk through a wall? You're going to say no. You know why? It don't make no sense. Because watch. 
They walk it through. He walked through a wall. They were in the upper room in a locked place, and he showed up. He walked in. But I can do the same thing he did or greater. Because the important part in this is we got to understand the Holy Spirit's the first premise. And I know I didn't give you all the questions. It's okay. You can read. The thing we have to build upon next, upon the Holy Spirit, is this. Through the total reformation of how you think. You know why you can't walk through that wall? You think you can't walk through that wall. You know why? Your personal experiences, every time you did, you bumped into it. And you never went through. You got no experience of doing it yourself or seeing somebody else do it. So our thinking says, that's impossible. But yet we'll say, I can do all things through Christ. Nothing's impossible with God. See what we're getting to in this? See, some of you that are at 1 and 1 and 2 equals 2 are tweaking bad right now. I'm talking quantum physics. I'm talking resonating. Everything vibrates and resonates with a frequency. Heaven has its own frequency. This is what we're talking about. What we're going to get out of the elementary school, okay? We're going right into past graduate school. I don't know. We're going into Holy Spirit school. There is no equivalent in the natural for it. So the thing is, I have to renew this. I have to stop thinking like I've always thought. I have to stop functioning with the ingrainedness in my DNA of my heritage and what they thought and what they experienced because you understand all that is in you. What your parents experienced, their parents experienced, their parents experienced, it's all in our DNA. And all that helps create how we are and how we think. So that's the key. Holy Spirit, foundation, solid, on a rock. Next thing we're going to build upon that rock is I've got to think differently. I can't be conformed into this world where they tell me how it functions. When they tell me I can't walk through that wall, when Jesus said I can do what he did and he walked through the wall. Know what I'm saying? That's what we're talking about here. We got to renew the way we think. Now, if you want to walk through the wall or not, again, that's your choice. Because this sanctification process, this transformation process is all up to us on how far we want to go. If you're good at one and one is two and that's where you're going to stay, fine, stay there. That's cool. If you're going to function in the quantum physics area, fine. Just make sure you both ain't fighting and arguing with each other. Know what I mean? The one and one and two are folk. Don't be telling them they're nuts. And don't be looking backwards this way and saying, oh, they're just little babies in Christ and they're immature and blah, blah, blah. No, no, no. It's a personal walk, a personal transformation. So how do we define transformation? Transformation is this. It means metamorphosis in the Greek. We know that. To be changed into something completely different. Okay, so Luke 9 28 to 32, we see the transfiguration of Jesus on the mount, right? He now was changed into something totally different that we see. So as I started reading that, the first three words of that, starting in verse um, 28, said, eight days later. So I kind of glossed over that, and I read the thing, and I got it all highlighted, and was going to talk about the transfiguration. But then I went and read it again. It said, eight days later. And I like, wouldn't let go. You know why? The Spirit of God wanted me to go back and see what happened eight days earlier. So that's what we're going to read first. Starting in verse 23 of Luke chapter 9. This is all out of the Passion Translation. It says this. Jesus said to all of his followers. Now notice, if you even read back before that, he had just fed the 5,000. So now you've got all these people. So let's just say for a round number, there's 5,000 people hanging out with Jesus. Jesus then goes and tells them about what's going to happen to him in Jerusalem. And then he gets to this point. So I'm going to assume 
I know that's not always good, and if I'm wrong, I'll repent. i get no problem doing that. But I'm going to assume there's a big crowd around when he said this, just because of the context of what it says. So starting in verse 23, it says, Jesus said to all of his followers, if you truly desire to be my disciple. So I like this because he put the onus right on them right away. If you truly desire. It ain't got nothing to do with me. If you truly desire. Notice he didn't say if you felt like it, if you wanted to. It's a desire. It's a hunger. It's something that you want. Since sometimes I know in my own life, I've wondered if, okay, are these things in the spirit realm do I really want, or would they just be cool to play with, or do I have a hunger and a desire to go after it? I'm trying to say that to delineate there's a difference. Because I think a lot of people have an emotional excitement to the things of God versus a true deep spiritual hunger and desire to go after it at all costs. Does that make sense? Because I know that's happened in my own life. Because that's why I think some people go for a while and then they quit. Because that, that going and quitting is an indication that it wasn't really a deep hunger and desire. It was an emotional excitement that kind of petered out. Jesus ain't talking about the petering out stuff. He's saying, if you truly desire to be my disciple, he said, you must. That's a very telling phrase, you must. It's not optional. So he says to everyone there, if you truly desire, okay, not feel like it, think it would be a cool thing to do, whatever. No, if you truly desire, you've got an inward hunger to be my disciple, then you must. Which is interesting because that phrase is already saying, you know what, basically you have to make me your Lord. Because you must do what I'm about to tell you. There is no option if this is going to happen. See, we make a lot of things in life optional. No, there is no option. He's saying, you must. Disown your life completely. You've got to disown your life completely. Disown it. So I put here, that little phrase is mine. It is leaving the old so that you can fully embrace the new. New name. You've got to leave the old and take a new name. The old has to go in order to embrace this. See, so you can't keep this and this at the same time. It's one or the other. It's not an either or in this case. No, it is an either or. It's not a both in this case. You must, what did he say again? Disown your life completely. See, we tend to hold on to pieces of it. Okay, God, you can have this piece, you can have this piece, but now I got this piece. No, you have to disown it completely. He says, embrace my cross as your own. And then that's the explanation from the Passion Translation. Be willing to suffer and die for Christ. You've got to be willing to suffer and die for Christ. That's pretty heavy. To suffer and die for him. He goes, and surrender to my ways. For if you choose self-sacrifice, giving up your lives for my glory, he says, you will embark on a discovery of more and more of true life. So to me, as I heard that, you're going to be transformed from glory to glory. The more you give up of you... But see, I want us to understand this. It's not a progressive giving up. It's a one-time done. The progression is our changing from glory to glory, but we have to come to that place and say, nope, I'm done. God, I'm all yours. See, we think we did that when we get saved. You have no idea what you did when you get saved. You are saved by his grace and his mercy. I look back at what I was and what I did and like, serious? Oh, I gave my life to God back then. No, you didn't. Many people just repeated a prayer and you had no idea what you were doing. You learned that. You kind of grew into that. Yes, you got saved because that's where your heart was. 
But I think we turn this sanctification, transformation process, whatever words I want to say, into, okay, I did that and I'm good. I'm at one and one is two and I'm good. And like I said, all this year has bubbled up stuff where it's like, uh, I'm not so quite sure I'm that good. Lord, you just showed me exactly where I was because of all this stuff going on and how I'm reacting and responding and what's happening in life. I think I got a little bit more work to do to walk out the fruit of the Spirit in my life. <laughs> know what I'm saying? So again, this ain't a condemnation thing. This is a, let's just be honest. Let's see where we're at. Let's decide where we want to go. And everyone's going to make those different decisions. We all got to be good with that together as a corporate body. But understand, it's a process that we have to totally give up our life, make his life ours, his ways, so that we can truly walk out that life. Because then he goes on and gives the other side of the coin. He says, but if you choose to keep your life for yourself, okay, if you're going to choose to keep it, and I can probably add in and not mess up the scripture, any, any little piece of it. Because he said you've got to completely give it all. He says you will lose what you try to keep. That's crazy. So basically the tighter you try to hold on to something, the less and less you'll be able to. It says, even if you gain the whole world, if you gain the wealth and power of this world, everything it could offer you, let yet lose your soul in the process, what good is that? As the old version was trying to come back as I was reading it, that's why I was kind of stammering a little bit. If you gain the whole world and lose your whole soul, gain, what point was it? It says, so then. This was interesting because I only saw this this morning as I was going over this again. Okay, so he just said all this to this crowd. Now let me tell you, that's a heavy word. There wasn't much love in that. I mean, he went right for the gut punch. It says, so why then are you ashamed of being my disciple? Wow. So he obviously saw something or got some kind of reaction or heard something going on when he was talking that he said, why are you ashamed of being my disciple? He says, are you ashamed of the revelation truth, which speaks of the logos, actually, I give to you? Are you ashamed of the word of God I just shared with you? He says, I, the Son of Man, will one day return in my radiant brightness with the holy angels and in the splendor and majesty of my Father. And I will be ashamed of all who are ashamed of me. That's a scary verse right there. When I come back, he says, I'm coming back with the angels. And if you've been ashamed of me, while you were here, I'm going to be ashamed of you. That doesn't sound like it's going to go well for the people that are ashamed. Who are those people? The ones that didn't give it to him. They didn't follow him. They didn't become that disciple. See, we think discipleship is nothing. We think discipleship is baby stuff. We think discipleship is going through this little class of learning basic doctrine and then we're cool. That's what the religions turned it into. No, discipleship is willing to die for him and endure the hardship he endured. But if you do that, you will also gain the glory of what he has. See, we've made gaining the glory and stuff, we've made it this candy-coated road that's... He didn't make it. And he's saying, why are you taking this word that I'm giving you as being so hard? Why are you ashamed of the word that I'm sharing with you? 
He said, but I promise you this. There are some who are standing here right now who will not die until they have witnessed the presence and power of God's kingdom realm. Then we get to the text and it says eight days later. Can you imagine? They had to stew on that for eight days. Now, I don't know if there was anything else in between. I didn't go check the other Gospels to actually get the timeline. But that's what it, it said to me when I read it. For eight days, they had to mull over what he just said. It's like, wow. He says, here you go. Boom. Now chew on it. Because again, it can't be an emotional reaction in response to what he's saying. It has to be a deep desire and hunger. So then it says, Jesus took Peter, Jacob, and John, we know Jacob was James, and climbed to a high mountain to pray. Okay, we're just continuing now. As he prayed, as he prayed, how do you pray? How is your prayer life? As he prayed, I haven't said this in a while, but you do know we pray here from 9.30 to quarter of 10. That's why if you walk in at that time, you see me pacing around and, and kind of mumbling, not mumbling, usually praying in tongues. That's what I'm doing. So you can come join. That's cool. But as he prayed, that's why we do the thing Friday night once a month too. As he prayed, look what happened. His face began to glow until it was a blinding glory streamed from him. Glory radiating from his face. And I already hear you saying, yeah, but that was Jesus. Renew your mind. Renew your mind. There's been times I've been told by people afterwards, it was kind of weird looking at you. This sounds weird, but you were glowing when you were preaching. I've had people come up and tell me that after. Did I know it? No. Was it a big deal? No. Is it biblical? Yeah. He was glowing. Glowing to the place, it says, that his entire body was illuminated with a radiant glory. Do you understand our spirit being is pure light? We are light. We are made of light. So the light was emanating from him. It's not something weird was going on. What was actually on the inside was coming out. He was being transformed. Transfigured, we called it. Why? Because he had told them eight days earlier, you're going to see the glory of God. There's going to be some of you that ain't going to die until you see the glory of God. Peter, James, and John saw the glory of God. God himself manifested before them. And you know what was weird? You go to the end, they were so stinking sleepy. They were falling asleep when that happened. But man, when he started shining, they woke right up. It reminded me, this is not a good illustration, but some of you will get a kick out of it. I remember being so drunk at times. When there was something dramatic happen, you woke up quick. I mean, you just went from a drunken stupor to like, I'm back. Because it was like, whoa. That's what happened here. Whoa. We ain't sleeping no more. Peter said to the place, man, he saw Moses. He saw Elijah. Hey, let me make a tabernacle for you guys. Whoa. I thought this was just another stinking prayer meeting. Whoa that I fall asleep at every time because it's just boring. Whoa! That happened when he prayed. And the boys were too tired to pray. And they're dozing off. And all of a sudden, whoa! It says all at once, verse 30 and 31, two men appeared in glorious splendor, Moses and Elijah. They spoke with Jesus <clears throat> about his soon departure from this world and the things he was destined to accomplish in Jerusalem. So when was the last time you were in a prayer meeting, folks started glowing, angelic beings started showing up, 
and destinies were being spoken. Never. Know why? He ain't renewed this. Know why? Because we function out of our soul, our logic, our experiences, our programmed DNA. At least bless God, some of you that are programmed with DNA have a Christian background for some generations. I don't. But all that we're trying to deal with is why we don't see that because we're still functioning as a mere human being, not understanding we are a spirit being walking out a temporary human existence. Because that's what transformation brings. Because Jesus said, you will do the things that I did and even greater. So can we start shining? Yeah, I, I better be able to or else he's a liar. And I know he ain't. Uh, can Moses and Elijah show up? Uh, yeah, they did. Can angelic beings or whatever show up and start sharing destinies and giving direction and encouragement? Yeah, because after Jesus was tempted by the devil, angels showed up and ministered to him. But know why we never look for that and see that? You don't see that kind of stuff when one and one equals two. No, again, it's not a slam. There's going to be people there. There's going to be people all along the journey. That's fine. It's not a condemnation. I'm just saying, like for me especially, I get excited when I read that. I want to see that. I want to be there. But I understand I can't be there if I'm still functioning at one and one is two. And I'm only functioning at one and one is two because this hasn't been renewed yet. Now you know what I mean, I'm not literally talking about my brain, but I'm talking about the transformation process that truly happens in my spirit man that now goes and infects my soul man and then manifests out of my physical being. Like I saw, what day was it, Friday? On the treadmill in the basement, instant. You know why? Because the quicker you cooperate with it and recognize it and go with it, it happens. Because I would hope to think I'm not there. Hopefully I'm thinking I'm in the algebraic, maybe trigonometry stage now. And you see things happen quicker. Because I'm willing to more engage. I'm understanding my part that, no, I got to completely die to self. I cannot think the way I used to act the way I used to, talk the way I used to, and again, all that is just a manifestation of the soul man. And as I said, as we've been going through this craziness of this year, things have been bubbling up, and it's like, okay, I don't like that. Well, I'll change that. And he does. But again, he's not changing me into something that I don't want to be. So let me explain that. I want to be changed into what he wants me to be. So I'm okay with him taking some stuff. Because I know when he removes the stuff, he can add stuff. Because there needs to be a hole of me gone that he can fill with the new me. And it took all this time to figure out he's been waiting on me in this whole deal. He's been waiting on me. To say, no, I'm, I'm letting go of that. And like I said, we all have changed. We all have progressed. But what I think is ha what happens is, and I'll just speak for me, we kind of get comfortable at where we're at and we think we are actually past where we really are. No, in this area of my life, I'm still really right here. But guess what? I used to be back there. So that's okay, I'm here. Like I said, it's not a negative thing, but when he reveals to you where you're at, then it's like, you know what, Lord, I'm not satisfied here. I wanna go there. I wanna go there. I wanna walk through that. Because you said I could. Why? Because there may be an unbeliever walk in here, 
And I'm talking like I'm talking, and I say, you're nuts, preacher. Okay, watch. One of these times, I'm going to disappear. And all you just start screaming. <laughs> As you're hearing me screaming in there. <laughs> hey, it worked this time. <laughs> but see, it's never going to work unless this changes. So again, the Spirit of God can bring me to that place. You know why? Because Jesus could do it. I can do it. But again, one of the important questions that we have to answer that I did not ask is this. What is your motivation in it? It's not to bring attention to self. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father. His light shone which brought glory to the Father. Because after that, if you keep reading the story of some of did, what did he say? My beloved son, hear him. What we do is to glorify him so that others may come to him. That's why we get to do the stuff. Not because we're all that in a bag of chips. Because this year, I think, has showed many of us we quite ain't where we thought we were. But you know what? That's okay. Because he's given us all a new name and a new destiny. And he's given us the Holy Spirit of God. And now he says, okay, let's engage in the process. Let's engage by the mercies of God that you present yourself a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So if you're continuing to function in sinful behavior, you're already blowing it in verse 1. You ain't getting to verse 2. You got to like, okay, I'm getting rid of that. I'm just no more. Because this thing I'm holding on to over here is keeping me from getting this thing over here. It's called ROI, return on investment. I can get rid of something that ain't no good for me and get a return that's so great I can't even imagine or think how great it is. And you know what the problem is? This, because we got no concept of it. That's why we know what the return we get on this. And it's kind of satisfying. We have no idea the return on this. All we do is see it in a book. We get no experience. And what's sad is we don't have many people around us that have the experience either. So we need some of us to start stepping up that have been in this a while, up in our game, so that we can show others, hey, you, I've been there. I got rid of that, and guess what? I got this. Let me show you how much better this was than that. Because that really wasn't doing you no good. Get rid of that, and you will grow glory to glory and walk out your divine destiny. So let's pray. Father, thank you. Lord, I don't have words. I could break out in tongues, but then people get wiggy. So that's cool. But Lord, you know my heart. And I'm just praising you on the inside that, you know what, Lord, it, you were so amazing. Because you reminded me again just how easy it is to get rid of junk. It, it took instant and Lord, there's other things I know take longer, but you know I needed that shot in the arm then. Because you're so great, because you minister to each one of us where we're at. So Father, I know there's some here this morning that could use a shot in the arm. So you do that today? And hopefully they understood what they got to do to get that shot in the arm. They got to get rid of something so that you can replace it with the better, the greater the thing we can't even imagine. So Lord, will you take your word as it's gone forth and we wouldn't respond the way that crowd responded to Jesus. But we'd say, yes, Lord. We say, I have a desire. I have a hunger to be a disciple. I have a hunger to see your glory manifested in my life so that I may point people to the Father because that's what this is all about. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, Father, as we walk this thing out, again, give us a true evaluation of where we're at 
Don't allow us to get discouraged when we see where we're at, but give us a clear vision and path to where you want to bring us to. Because, Lord, I know we can't even see the end because the end is glory. I mean, the end is just continues. There is no end in transformation. It's from glory to glory to glory that we may manifest your glory because you said in the end your kids are going to manifest your glory throughout all eternity for all ages. We're going to light up the universe, Lord, because we allowed you to transform us here and now. And we're going to light up the universe because we know darkness can't stand against light. So, Father, will you awaken us, clean us up, and let us shine before men that they may see our good works. Yes, Lord, you said they were our good works, but that they may glorify you because of them. Lord, we love you and praise you and worship you now. We go from this place blessed and encouraged. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.